Okay, how's that? We good? Great. Thank you. Subcommittee will come to order. Without objection, objection, the chair is authorized to declare recess at any time. We'll now have the Pledge of Allegiance led by Representative Moore from Alabama.
Thank you, Mr. Moore. We welcome everyone to today's hearing on organized retail crime and threats to public safety. Without objection, the gentleman from California, Mr. Swa, will, will be permitted to participate in today's hearing. And uh, I will now recognize myself for an opening statement. I'm pleased to be here at the subcommittee hearing. With, I'm grateful to all the witnesses for being here. Uh, the topic before us today is a hearing titled The Rise in Organized Retail Crime and the Threat to Public Safe Safety. Organized retail crime is a growing threat to our retailers and their employees, our law enforcement, and our communities. The fact that we are having this hearing in some ways is very disappointing. We used to be a country that adhered to the rule of law. We used to be a country of sharing a sense of trust and respect for our fellow Americans, and that trust and respect in many respects seems to be gone. And so too is the rule of law. And when the rule of law is gone, it threatens our very freedom. Three years ago, during the summer of love, our country burned and our stores were looted. Consequences seemed to have been few. Organized retail crime has become a growing problem over these past three years because criminals see the opportunity for profit and know they can get away with it. Lululemon, Lululemon, I'm not even sure how you say that. Lululemon. Yeah, Lululemon, yeah. And I, I actually think I had a relative who worked for Lululemon. But anyway, nonetheless. Lululemon CEO Calvin McDonald stood by the retailer's, retailer's recent decision to fire two employees who tried to intervene during a theft at one of, his, one of its stores. California is in the process of passing laws prohibiting retail employers from training employees to inter, actually intervene in shoplifting and active shooters. Uh, S, that's their SB 553. We are coddling criminals and faming the flames of this problem, and it's open season on our stores, and criminal syndicates are taking advantage. The National Retail Federation found that eight in 10 retailers said the violence and aggression associated with organized retail crime incidents increased in the past year. Organized retail crime can happen in as little time as just two minutes. A CVS executive recently testified that organized retail crime events are reported in a CVS pharmacy store every three minutes. In just two minutes, the average professional thief targeting CVS steals $2,000 worth of goods. Two minutes, $2,000 worth of goods. These are not cases of simple shoplifting. The Biden administration and rogue Democrat prosecutors have eroded law and order in this country, creating an environment where retail workers are terrified to go to work. The rise in organized retail crime is causing businesses to close and endangers the public. Walmart, for example, is losing $3 billion per year in US revenue due to theft and is considering closing stores and increasing prices due to the severity of theft across the country. Who pays the price? Well, consumers do. Consumers are paying to cover the losses by retailers. And with Biden's historic inflation, that becomes an extra challenge, particularly for those who are poor. Let's hear how retail CEOs and others in the retail industry state the problem. Bob Nardelli, the former Home Depot CEO stated, today this thing is an epidemic. It's spreading faster than COVID. The degree of severity now is not just theft, it's smash and grab. Our associates are afraid. The retail salespeople are afraid. Consumers are afraid. We've got to get control of this. And if the administration doesn't get control of this, they're abdicating it to the businesses, both public and private. Bob Eddy, BJ's CEO stated, organized retail crime is definitely a thing. We see it, and it is material. It is a much more pointed problem in certain places, particularly on the West Coast or places like Chicago or Albuquerque that have blue state or local blue governments that don't really feel like prosecuting crime. We have a poster behind me. Ira Kress, president of Giant Food, has posted this particular message in his supermarkets. You may, quote, you may notice changes to your checkout experience as you are shopping with us today. Due to a significant increase in crime and theft that we, may, we and many other retailers are experiencing across our market area, we have made several changes to our operating procedures to mitigate the impact of theft to our business. We know that these changes may cause some inconvenience or be disruptive to the experience you're used to, and I assure you we are making these changes out of necessity to prioritize the safety of our associates and customers." Close quote. He has further said, to say that theft has risen tenfold in the last five years would not be an understatement. It has increased exponentially. The last thing I want to do is close stores, but I've got to be able to run them safely and profitably. 
And that's exactly what's happening. These retailers are closing stores, costing our commodity, our, excuse me, our communities jobs and reducing America's, Americans access to basic commodities. Retailers are forced to raise their costs or close stores. And that's particularly true in communities that can least afford higher price of goods or scarcity of opportunity to get those goods. It is the law-abiding Americans who pay the price, not the criminals. Walmart decided to shut down 17 of its stores after CEO Doug McMillan warned that theft was the highest it's ever been around the country, including ha closing half of its Chicago stores, where thefts are up 25%, according to the Chicago Police Department, while robberies are up 11%. Walmart has also permanently closed stores due to retail theft in South Bend, Indiana, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Honolulu, Hawaii, Albuquerque, New Mexico, Washington, D.C., and Atlanta, Georgia. Target has seen $400 million in lost profits in 2022 due to a note to uh, organized gangs of shoplifters and has permanently closed stores in College Park, Maryland, Minneapolis, Minnesota, Minnesota Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Walgreens has closed five locations in crime-ridden San Francisco and others in Chicago, Houston, and Orlando. Macy's has a three-year plan to close 125 stores, citing increases in retail crime, which has resulted in drops in profits. Best Buy is closing 20, years, excuse me, 20 stores a year for the same reason. Bed Bath & Beyond has identified 416 of its 1,500 stores for closure. Unfortunately, some retailers and prosecutors are more interested in protecting criminals than they are protecting their own employees. It is clear that some prosecutors and bail reform laws in Democrat-run cities and, and states are emboldening criminals and fueling a rise in organized retail crime. We've even heard it from our own witnesses during the violent crime field hearing we had in Manhattan earlier this year. Democrat city councilman Robert Holden provided a grim description of everyday life in Manhattan when he said, mentally ill homeless people verbally and physically attack people randomly on the streets and in the subway. Pharmacies lock up their products. The police officers also feel pressured to undercharge perps they arrest. This is a daily reality in New York, close quote. Criminals know they can avoid prosecution and incarceration if they stay below, stay below the felony threshold. In jurisdictions with rogue prosecutors who do not prosecute misdemeanor theft, criminals can steal just below the threshold and avoid prosecution altogether. This has been a problem in California, especially where many jurisdictions have rogue, rogue prosecutors in 2014, voters in California passed a law which raised the felony threshold for theft from $400 to $950 in the state. Lowering felony thresholds would not be needed if prosecutors actually prosecuted misdemeanors and lax bail reform laws did not let criminals go free. Broken window policing does work. Instead, we are seeing lax and in some cases non-existent prosecution grow a new generation of criminals. The rise in organized retail crime in California comes as the California legislature is advancing a bill that would prevent retail staff from even stopping thieves from stealing inside stores. The legislation has passed the state Senate and is pending in the state assembly. California Retailers Association panned the legislation as an invitation for criminals to come in and steal. Not weeks after the tragic death of Blake Mose did the California state Senate pass this disgraceful legislation. Employees cannot intervene in crimes and criminals can steal up to $900 in goods with impunity. So why would you open a store in California? Well, you wouldn't. That's why so many retailers have left these Democrat-run cities. Thankfully, some states are actually stepping up to the plate to combat these violent criminal enterprises. The state of Kansas signed into law Senate Bill 174. Among other provisions, the law authorizes the Kansas Attorney General's Office to be the primary prosecutor in the state for crimes such as ORC that incur in two or more counties. More than 30 states have actually pa passed anti-ORC laws. And while I assert that this is largely a state and local issue, it is important for us to understand that these ORC cartels are crossing state lines. Federal laws that can be used in, in uh, prosecution of these include uh, 18 U.S.C. 2314, Interstate Transport of Stolen Property, 18 U.S.C. 96, RICO, and 18 U.S.C. 1956. I'm glad we have states that understand the growing threat of organized retail crime in their communities, and we're willing to hold these criminals accountable, and are willing to hold these criminals accountable. It's time we fight back against organized retail crime. It has to be stopped. Criminals must be penalized, 
and prosecutors need to be held responsible for failing to protect their communities from this violent crime. We must restore law and order to our communities and make America safe again. And I'm going to uh, submit two letters for the record, from the national, one from the National Retail Federation dated June 13, 2023, uh, talking about the rise in organized retail crime, and then also CHEP, uh, which is a uh, CHEP USA, um, in response to our notice of this hearing, and they'll be admitted without objection. So, so ordered. And um, our ranking member is not here. We'll save time for her to, to speak when she gets in. And, um, and I don't see either the ranker or the, the chair of the full committee. So we'll go. I I just, I'm just going to go ahead and yeah. in, in, I'm going to recognize um, uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Swalwell. Mr. Yeah. Swalwell. Thank you, Chairman. And uh, thank you for inviting uh, Ms. Moss uh, of Newark, California, who lost her son, uh, Blake, eight weeks ago uh, today. Ms. Moss will tell Blake's story momentarily, uh, but I just want to express uh, to Ms. Moss on behalf of the 14th Congressional District uh, and my family uh, our deepest sympathies for the loss of Blake, uh, such an extraordinary young man who was to be engaged or who was to be married this summer. Uh, who we lost at 26 years old, uh, an Eagle Scout, which we know is uh, one of the most elite clubs anyone can be a part of, uh, somebody uh, who anyone who knew him, uh, he lit up uh, their world. And my promise to you uh, is the representative uh, of Pleasanton, California, where uh, his murder took place, uh, is to be an advocate uh, for justice, uh, not only uh, for Blake uh, and to make sure uh, that justice is served in this case, uh, but that we do uh, address uh, retail crime uh, in this country. And I have worked with our FBI field office for many years about trying to lend more federal resources to local law enforcement so that they can crack down uh, on retail crime. Uh, I'll also say, uh, personally, my father was not only a police officer, but when he retired, a loss prevention agent. Uh, and I know, uh, you know what loss prevention agents uh, like Blake encounter every day. And so, uh, again, just on behalf of my office, uh, thank you for coming here. I know it's not easy, uh, but we look forward to hearing you tell Blake's story and make sure that justice is served. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Swell. Thank you for being here with us today. And again, Ms. Moss, thank you. Uh, we appreciate it so much. So um, I'm going to begin now by introducing our, our witnesses, um, all who are were gracious enough to come and testify for this committee in this important issue. The first we have is the Honorable Chris Kobach. Chris Kobach is the Attorney General of Kansas and previously served as the Secretary of State of Kansas. He graduated from Harvard University, received his JD from Yale University, and received a PhD from the University of Oxford. He clerked on the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, taught constitutional law at the University of Missouri Kansas City School of Law, and served in the Department of Justice during the George W. Bush administration. Thank you for being here, uh, Mr. Kobach. Ms. Lori Moss is the mother of Blake Moss. Blake was shot and killed during an attempted shoplifting at a Home Depot just a few weeks ago. Her son was a loss prevention employee and was just 26 years old. The alleged murderer had prior convictions for theft and fled the scene with her boyfriend and toddler. She was arrested later by a police officer and appreciate Mr. Swalwell's uh, kind introduction of you as well. Uh, the Honorable John J. Flynn is currently serving his second term as the District Attorney of Erie County, New York. Prior to his election, he worked in private practice as a personal injury attorney and was a lecturer at SUNY Buffalo State. Mr. Flynn served in the Navy during the Gulf War and later in the Judge Advocate General Gore after receiving his law degree. Law degree. He currently serves as the president of the National District Attorneys Association. Uh, welcome and thank you for your service, Mr. Flynn. The Honorable John Milheiser. Mr. Milheiser is the former U.S. Attorney for the Central District of Illinois. He previously served as the state's attorney for Sangamon County. Did I say that right, Sangamon? That's right. County, Illinois. Since leaving the U.S. Attorney's Office, he has founded the American Center for Law and Public Safety with other former U.S. attorneys. The center is a bipartisan organization dedicated to safeguarding the rule of law, civil liberties, and the Constitution through education, 
research, recruitment, and advocacy. We thank you, Mr. Milheiser, for being here. We'll now begin by asking you to please stand, and I will swear you in. If you'd each please stand and raise your right hand. Do each of you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you are about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, so help you God? Let the record reflect that each of the witnesses has answered in the affirmative. Please be seated. Thank you. And, and please know that we have received your written records. They will, uh, your written statements, they're all going to be part of, made part of the record uh, in their entirety. Uh, therefore, we ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes. Um, and I, I don't know if we have a, a yellow and a, uh, a light to let you know when you're getting to the last minute or so, but uh, I will probably start tapping here when you have about 10 or 15 seconds to go so you know it's time to wrap up. But thank, each, thank you each, and we'll start with you, Mr. Kobach. Uh, is your mic on? The green light is on. Oh, there we go. There we go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, members of the committee, for addressing this important topic. Uh, the amount of retail crime in Kansas is surprisingly high. We are among the top 10 states hit by, in, in terms of dollars uh, stolen in, in organized retail crime, uh, but we're not in the top 10 in violent crimes or gun crimes or many other categories of crimes. And uh, the reason most law enforcement give for that is the I-70 corridor. Um, Kansas and Missouri are both in the top 10. The other states in the top 10s are ones you'd expect, like California, Texas, Florida, some of the very large, more populous states. Um, the I-70 corridor is a pipeline not only for organized retail crime, but also for drugs. And there's often a great deal of overlap between uh, drugs and organized retail crime because the drug addicted are often recruited as boosters by the um, people who run the organized crime rings or networks. Um, the, uh, I thought I would give you some typical cases from Kansas, which I believe are typical not only of our state, but of most states where organized retail crime is an issue, which is increasingly all of the states. Um, recently, we saw the guilty plea of Frank Santa Maria in March 2023 in Kansas City. Uh, he owned a pawn shop, which was the hub of the organized crime network. Pawn shops are very frequently the, the hub of these networks. Uh, he had four boosters who stole merchandise for him. Uh, he, he then sold the stolen products on eBay pages. Uh, more than $100,000 in stolen products were sold for a total of over $3 million. Just to give you a, a, a glimpse of what his network looked like, uh, they stole from Home Depot, Lowe's, Walmart, Target, Walgreens, uh, and CVS. The stolen products included ink cartridges, spy point cameras, Nikon range finders, electric fence systems, Rogaine products, Nicorette, Nicorette products, over-the-counter supplements, and Crest white strips. Um, because the crimes were sold in both Kansas and Missouri, creating an interstate nexus, and because the amount stolen was over $250,000, which is usually the threshold these days for uh, federal prosecutors, um, federal prosecutors were interested and the case was brought in federal court. Uh, another case in the Kansas City area, Dennis Russell pled guilty in a similar scheme. Again, a pawn shop was the hub of the organized retail crime network. 14,000 14, stolen items uh, for a total of over $740,000 and sold on eBay. The, the types of stolen items were a little bit different. Uh, robot vacuum cleaners, television stream, streaming devices, and yes, textbooks. Um, similar network, a, a group of four to eight boosters centered uh, on a pawn shop. Um, in another case, in a different case in Kansas, uh, this one without the interstate nexus, the, again, the retail crime organization focused on a pawn shop, uh, stealing over $200,000 from pre predominantly box stores. It's a, a fairly common pattern. So to summarize some of the commonalities, you typically see box stores being hit two to three times per week. The fence at the center is usually, a, or in Kansas, is usually a pawn shop, but oftentimes it's just a warehouse that's used to move the goods. Almost all of the products are sold online. Um, factors in the legal system that are exacerbating this problem. Number one, many of the cases do not get prosecuted. A, a huge number do not get prosecuted due to the lack of prosecutorial capacity at the county level. Many DAs simply have too large a stack of crimes. Non-person crimes like this get moved to the bottom of the stack and consequently don't get prosecuted. Compounding this is a lack of prosecutorial capacity, which one of the other witnesses may be able to address at the federal level. And in our area, they have a $250,000 threshold. If you, don't, if you can't show that 250 grand has been stolen uh, in your network of stores, then you're probably not gonna get your case prosecuted. 
Um, investigative capacity is also limited. Police departments only have a limited number of detectives, and if you've got multiple stores getting hit multiple times each day, uh, they don't have the capacity to investigate all of them. On top of that, there's a third problem in the courts. Uh, many courts are setting bail too low for, uh, for the criminals, much lower than they did in the past. And on top of that, bail bondsmen today uh, are willing to accept a much lower percentage of the bail amount than they were, say, 20 or 30 years ago. As a combination of those two things, it's highly likely that the booster will be back out on the street before the end of the day. Um, policy recommendations in Kansas, as the chairman mentioned, we've tried to bring state prosecution uh, to bear where more than one uh, uh, county is involved in a course of criminal conduct. Uh, I think the federal legislation before this committee is a very good step. I would also encourage, to the extent it's possible, U.S. attorney prosecutors to uh, lower that threshold from $250,000. I just want to summarize by saying we've talked about the economic consequences, but there is a, a bigger consequence, in the degradation, and that's the degradation of the rule of law. And I just want to end with a, a quick story. I went into a Walgreens recently and talked to a clerk, and her store is hit two, three times a day. And she, I asked her what she does, and she said, well, she finally decided to start following the boosters through the store, heckling them and harassing them against store policy. And I asked her why she did that, and she said because she can't stand what's happening to the reputation of her store and her neighborhood. She's fighting to, to, to preserve our culture where the rule of law is intact. Thank you, Mr. Coban. Ms. Mose, uh, Mrs. Mose, we're ready for you in your five minutes. Good afternoon. Thank you for the time. Thank you for taking the time to hear my story. My son is Lori Mose, and my son's name is Blake Mose. He was born on January 14, 1997, and it was murdered on April 18, 2023, at the young age of 26. In, his, in my son's short 26 years, he was a chef, an Eagle Scout, a church youth leader, a Newark Police Department cadet, but most of all, he was a friend, a nephew, a cousin, a grandson, a brother, and my son. Blake lived a life of community service, dedicated to fighting for the underdog and a love for his family. He lived life to the fullest every day, laughing often and giving the best hugs imaginable. In early 2022, Blake became an asset protection associate for Home Depot. He worked to gain additional experience before applying to the Newark Police Department. When I spoke with Blake on our every Wednesday calls, he would tell me about his training at Home Depot. He would explained that he was trained to locate shoplifters within the store, document their actions, track shoplifters through the store, follow them outside and apprehend them. Then he would bring the shoplifters back into the store to complete a theft report, take photos, and then turn them over to law enforcement if, re if required. When I asked my son about the risk of his new job at Home Depot and if he was provided any personal protective equipment, he quickly would tell me no. I would ask if he'd been issued any bulletproof breasts, pepper spray, or safety gear, and he would again tell me no. During many of my calls, we would talk about the level of theft he experienced within Home Depot. He would tell me of the theft rings he would help gather evidence for for local police departments and how excited he was to work with the officers. Blake would tell me about the many weapons he had pulled on him, including knives and guns by shoplifters. When I asked about how he could manage to be safe, my son would tell me he could simply hide behind a post to avoid being shot or hurt. As a mom, my concerns began to grow at the lack of PPE he had been issued by Home Depot. All of my concerns and fears were realized by one phone call. On Tuesday, April 18th, the voice over the phone declared that my son had been shot. I quickly called Eden Medical where he had been transported to get an update. I spoke with the emergency room doctor and he simply told me to come as quickly as I could. I asked if I needed to gather my family and he said yes. At that moment, I knew my son was dead. On April 18th, 2023, eight weeks ago today, at 2.15 Pacific Standard Time, my son was shot at close range by a shoplifter 
while working as an asset protection officer at Home Depot in Pleasanton, California. My son and his teammate had been called into action as Benicia Knapp attempted to steal a charger from the tool department. My son encountered Knapp at the back of the store where her getaway driver, David Guillory, was awaiting to flee the scene. According to witness statements, my son took the item from Knapp and walked back into the store. Knapp followed my son back into the store. When he turned around, she pulled out her gun from her purse and shot my son in the heart of all places. He fell face forward to the ground and dropped the item. Knapp picked up the item from his dead body and fled in the getaway car. In the days to come, I would learn that Guillory, the getaway driver, was a felon. He had served jail time for home invasion robbery, but was let go during COVID. We learned that Knapp, my son's executor, had been in and out of trouble since 1995. She was in violation of probation since 2012, but was still roaming the streets free. She also had a concealed permit that had been revoked along with her security guard card. For both Bill Guillory and Knapp, the judicial system failed to rehabilitate them properly. The system failed to keep them accountable for their private actions, leading to the escalation in criminal behavior, leading to the shooting death of my son. The system failed because instead of rehabilitating criminals, we release them early, we do not execute proper charges in court, and we fail to seek probation violators. The system failed my son. He was asked to do a job with a small wage and a high risk, leading to his death. Home Depot failed to provide proper protective equipment to secure his safety and carry out his required duties. OSHA failed to make safety a priority for asset protection officers and mandate bulletproof vests. The system failed Blake's future self. He will never be married. He will never have a child. He will never grow old. We will never have another family photo. We will never hear his laughter or feel his hugs. I will never get to say I love you and I'm proud of you. And I'll never hear it back. What we do have is 26 wonderful years of memories that were cut too short. The failing of so many could have prevented his death. Our hope is that our story helps this committee understand the importance and the urgency for change. Thank you for your time and listening to our story. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing that uh, very poignant story. Thank you. Chair recognizes Mr. Flynn. Thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Biggs, uh, members of the subcommittee. Uh, as was alluded to, my name is John Flynn, and I'm the elected district attorney of Erie County, New York. That is the home of Buffalo, New York. Uh, I am also the elected, uh, the president of the National District Attorneys Association, better known, it's also known as NDAA. Uh, NDA recognizes the vital role that prosecutors play in the safety of local communities, including addressing the serious challenge of retail theft and organized retail crime. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. Let me begin with a couple of statistics to give you the scope of the problem. According to a report by the Retail Industry Leaders Association on the impact of all forms of retail theft, almost $70 billion worth of products were stolen from U.S. retailers in 2019. Connected to that is the cost of federal and state governments in lost personal and business tax revenues, estimated about $15 billion. These statistics are compromised by or comprised of large and small urban and rural communities. Organized retail crime and retail theft are equal opportunity destroyers of communities and must be addressed to ensure healthy and vibrant communities. We have to differentiate though between the two and break down the types of defendants as seen by law enforcement and prosecutors. In my county of almost one million people, we see mainly three categories. First, are the organized crime syndicates, the Russian crime syndicates, the mafia, the Mexican cartels, and other highly sophisticated gangs and other transnational rings. The second group I would characterize as 
loosely affiliated group affiliations. Uh, individuals, uh, groups of five, four to five individuals that get together and steal merchandise. The third category I would call just the random individuals. Those who commit theft for personal use. This category often involves a single individual who is suffering from a substance abuse disorder, mental illness, is homeless, or has economic challenges. Overall, we are seeing the vast majority of activity in my community and when I talk to most local prosecutors in the second and third categories of defendants. However, it's important to note that the first group of defendants very much exist. Both retail theft and organized retail crime have a negative impact on communities. Unfortunately, it sometimes involves violence as well as damage to storefronts and other property. That's on top of the economic loss, which then adds to the burden faced by consumers. I think we can all agree that this has to change. The approach, the approach must be targeted and must be tailored as opposed to a one-size-fits-all strategy. We must address the issue holistically. For those individuals who steal for their own personal use, they may need services like alcohol, drug, or mental health treatment. For more sophisticated operations, particularly involving repeat offenders, a more law and order approach is needed, such as incarceration. Each category of defendant, and even each individual within the categories, must be treated differently depending on the circumstances and facts of each case. It is also important to understand who is generally handling these cases and these categories as defendants. The first category of organized criminal groups is handled primarily by the federal government through agencies like the Homeland Security Investigations and U.S. Attorney's offices acting through the Department of Justice. This is particularly important when criminals cross state lines or even international borders. The second and third category defendants are local in nature and I believe should be handled by local law enforcement and my district attorney prosecutorial agencies. That requires law enforcement prosecutors to step up and acknowledge the serious nature of these crimes and their impact on communities. Just last week, my office prosecuted a habitual offender for retail theft after being banned from several stores. He was given six years in prison. Who can, and this individual continued to steal even when picked up an outstanding warrant. The bottom line is that shoplifting is not a victimless crime. We should not tolerate these thefts and should hold offenders accountable for their crimes. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you about these important and complex issues. NDA stands ready to assist as we look for ways to tackle organized retail crime and retail theft that th threatens the vibrancy of our communities. Thank you, Mr. Flynn. Mr. Milheiser. Thank you, Chair Biggs and distinguished members of the committee. Thank you very much for the opportunity to address you on this important topic. The rise in organized retail crime and the, the corresponding threat to public safety. I've spent the majority of my career as a state and federal prosecutor working on these very issues and the main overriding issue of public safety and safe communities. My name is John Milheiser, and from 2018 to 2021, I served as the United States Attorney for the Central District of Illinois. Prior to that, from 2010 to 2018, I served as the state's attorney or local DA for Sangamon County, Illinois, of which I was a member of the NDAA, uh, which uh, DA Flynn is the president of. And in both positions, my goal was the same, to work each day to make my community safer. And that should be the goal of every prosecutor in this country, and I'm not sure it is. At the outset, I recognize that this is a congressional hearing, and as a former U.S. attorney, I'm fully aware that federal prosecutors and federal law enforcement agencies can be important partners in investigating and prosecuting organized crime. However, the bulk of the heavy lifting in prosecuting crime in the United States is performed by state and local prosecutors. The individuals on the front line tasked with keeping our communities safe are the 2,500 or so elected and appointed DAs and their offices around the country at the state and local level. These prosecutors have tremendous, 
have a tremendous amount of discretion. And unfortunately, as we have seen in some jurisdictions, when they come in and fail to do their job, crime increases. It's a difficult job, but an incredibly important one. To have safe communities, we need to ensure that we have good prosecutors in every jurisdiction in the country. And we need to ensure that these prosecutors have access to the resources necessary to successfully prosecute crimes, which are becoming increasingly more sophisticated. Organized retail crime has both national and international components. It's become a serious problem for nationwide retailers and can be devastating to small local businesses. Organized retail crime is distinguishable from ordinary retail theft, given its large scale and its focus on converting stolen goods to cash through resale or to gift cards through store returns. Theft can occur throughout the supply chain. Organized retail theft drives up costs, requires diversion of already scarce resources, results in lost tax, lost tax revenue, and significantly puts individuals at risk. To successfully combat this worsening trend, we need tools for law enforcement and local prosecutors. And we need local prosecutors committed to preserving the rule of law and protecting the public. During my time as U.S. Attorney and State's Attorney, I participated in a number of topic-specific task forces, which included state and federal prosecutors, law enforcement, and relevant government and private agencies. Coordination is key in dismantling criminal enterprises, whether it be human trafficking, illegal drugs, or organized retail theft. For example, while most crimes are prosecuted locally, the federal government is uniquely positioned to investigate online multi-jurisdictional resale of stolen goods. Additionally, there is legislation being considered here on Capitol Hill that could help, including broadening the scope of cases in which the U.S. Attorney's offices can be involved and federal charges can be filed, and utilizing federal asset forfeiture to take away the proceeds from organized retail crime and to disrupt operations. When considering the increase in organized retail theft, one must examine the rise in crime in general and how to address the overall problem. We need federal authorities to provide resources, expertise, and partnerships. But at the end of the day, we need local prosecutors to step up and do their jobs. Earlier this year, I, along with several other former U.S. attorneys from around the country, formed a bipartisan organization to address this very issue called the American Center for Law and Public Safety. We identified five core principles needed by responsible prosecutors around the country in, in order to be effective. These are prioritize public safety. You think that would be a given, but it's not for some prosecutors when they come in. Number two, respect for the rule of law. Some prosecutors come in and they say, you know what? I don't care what the legislature says. I'm gonna go ahead and not follow what they say, and I'm gonna not charge certain offenses that are on the books. Support victims' rights. They're often forgotten in the equation, but the victims of these offenses. Collaboration with law enforcement. They are a part of the answer, not the problem. And support post-sentence reentry, which good prosecutors, responsible prosecutors know that because these folks that are locked up, 99% of them are gonna get out. If they go right back to that same environment that they were in, we're silly to think they're gonna change their behavior. So we need to put them in the best position to not reoffend. Being a modern day prosecutor is a difficult job dealing with limited resources but it's a vital, vitally important job. And a prosecutor's most important duty is to protect the public. Working together, we can achieve the goal of safe communities and allow individuals and businesses to prosper. Thank you for this opportunity and for raising awareness on this issue. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank, thank you, Thank you, Mr. Milheiser. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Wisconsin for his five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Kovac. Um, do you think the lawlessness we're seeing in our country, and we are seeing it over the last number of years, and the defund the police movement, this lack of respect for law enforcement, do you think this has contributed to what we're seeing here? I do, sir. And there's, at the end of my comments, I briefly noted on this, this there's a cultural element here too. It's a, a lack of respect for the rule of law and it gets to a point in certain areas where people feel like shoplifting is accepted or at least tolerated or nothing's being done about it. 
And there's also a, a subculture among the boosters and among people who may not be part of organized retail crime networks, but nevertheless shoplift for personal reasons. And there are, there are communities on Reddit where they routinely talk about sharing strategies for um, crime, for, for different stores and how to hit different types of stores differently and what the policies are. And so there is definitely a, um, a shift in the culture of certain communities in, in, in geographically where, where the organized retail crime is hitting. And I think uh, that's, that's a problem. And, and it's more than just stores being hit and a lack of prosecution. There's, it's being accepted in some uh, quarters. And so I think by taking action, we also restore the rule of law in a, in a sort of cultural sense, both for the communities and for the entire country. Ms. Moles, you, you commented about um, there perhaps should be some additional safety um, requirements put in place for people like your son uh, who's in a job like he's doing. Um, do you, you live in California. We're certainly seeing uh, what is happening in California um, where um, legislature is basically endorsing crime and um, with some of their public policy actions. Do you agree with the characterization that uh, Mr. Kovac just laid out? I only involve myself um, in this instance with my son's passing, unfortunately, and so defunding police and things of that, those are not my expertise. I just know how my son passed and what I'm fighting for in my own community. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so I'd share a story. Um, I think, Mr. Milheiser, you um, laid it out quite well there. Um, I have spoken repeatedly in this committee in regards to the district attorney down in Milwaukee County who um, uh, has accepted this lawlessness in his county. Um, there's a story here um, that there's a serial retail uh, thief um, stolen thousands of uh, power tools 14 times from various Home Depot stores throughout the area since August of 2021, yet the Milwaukee County District Attorney has not charged any of those instances. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to enter this into the record, a story from Wisconsin right now, serial retail theft suspect, 14 cases, failure to charge. Without objection. And um, if you'll remember, it's that same district attorney that let Daryl Brooks out on a $1,000 bail. He was a serial recidivist, uh, including violent crimes. He was the perpetrator of the Waukesha Christmas Day Parade from, what was that, a year and a half ago? Free on $1,000 bail. Uh, six people were killed when he drove his automobile through that parade. I believe there were about 60 people that were injured. Um, this is the kind of thing that's happening around America where we have these prosecutors that are doing things like that. Um, I think we would be remiss, Mr. Chairman, because I think you laid it out quite well in your opening uh, statement about the lawlessness that pervades America. We see it down on the southern border, uh, which we've heard about repeatedly in this committee, where we have a Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security that denies that there's a problem on the border, even in the face of the head of um, Border Patrol saying differently that the border is not secure. But we're seeing this lawlessness generally across America. And, uh, but I think I would be remiss, Mr. Chairman, in not pointing out that some of the woke corporations that are coming to us now and saying, hey, we need relief, we don't disagree with you. But you need to not fund these activities that are going on and these organizations that are perpetrating some of this crime. I think it's very important that you step up. And also, I would just say to local citizens around America, I know you want to vote for Democrats. That's what you believe in. But when you're in the big cities of America, Gentlemen's it is why expired. you're seeing the lawlessness. You need to vote for people who are going to be tough on crime. Gentlemen's time's expired. Chair recognizes the gentle lady, Ms. Dean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to all our testifiers for being here today. I'm Madeline Dean. I represent suburban Philadelphia, uh, Montgomery and Berks counties. And so, Mrs. Mose, um, to you, thank you for your courage to come here today, to tell your story, to tell Blake's story. Uh, 
It is heartbreaking. It's crushing to hear something like that, which should have been abundantly preventable, happen to your beautiful 26-year-old young man. From what I understand, a young man who wanted to go in law enforcement himself, was proud of what he was engaging in. And it, it comes at a time that strangely on the floor right now is being argued about making legal a stabilizer brace to make weapons more lethal at a time in our country when we're struggling with gun violence. It comes at a time when we can't get the majority party to do anything around gun violence. Thoughts and prayers is all they do. I want you to know that there are many of us here who are fighting to make sure that the kind of person who shot your son does not possess a weapon. We have laws. She was a prohibited purchaser. We have to make sure we do better by our children. So I wanted to give you a minute to tell us a little bit more about your son and just to take back to your family our abiding love and sympathy for your unimaginable loss. Tell us a little bit more about your son. Thank you so much. I, I, I appreciate your words. They are beyond kind. And um, when I talk personally about my son versus in a very, you know, eloquent way, um, the things I think about are the moments we're really going to miss our traditions without him. Our Thanksgiving prayer that my father hosts that will not host this year, that prayer, because to say the ones we've lost, he now adds to the chain of my grandmother and my aunt. My son is there. And so my son lived the biggest life possible and everybody he touched is better. I'm better for being his mom. So, and his brother is better for being his brother. There's a blessing in that, but we are very, very sorry. Um, and I, you just have my commitment that we will do everything possible to get our arms around this incredible problem. Retail theft, obviously very serious, but violent crime uh, and gun deaths in this country. When we lose 45, 46, 47,000 people to gun violence every single year in this country. Uh, and, and we have a party that we, we tried to have a hearing last week uh, and no one on the other side of the aisle would give us a hearing room so that victims like you, survivors like you, could speak. We had to go over to the Senate side. So very interested in retail crime, not very interested in saving lives. I will yield. Uh, Ms. Moss, I also want to make sure we recognize your, your father is a retired police officer, deputy sheriff, is that right, and then became a police chief? Yes, my father, Roy Froome, is um, seated behind me, and um, he is my, my strength today. Yeah. Um, he is a retired sheriff's, and he also went to the FBI Academy here in D.C., and um, has lived a wonderful um, life and was a wonderful grandfather. And Ms. Moss, can you also tell us, you have this public forum, a forum that you never wanted, but you know, to the prosecutors in this case, I hope they're listening to this. What do you want to see as an outcome? We should be charging this case appropriately, and we should be charging the case based on facts and not on personal opinion or personal agenda. We should be using the judicial system as it should be used, not for personal gain, but for safety of our, our communities and our children by not charging the proper gun, which is discharge and death, Venetia Knapp will serve much less of a sentence, and the DA's office is refusing to do so. It's not fair that we have to be victimized again to fight for our child and to fight for justice and the right things to happen in court. Thank you, Ms. Moss. Yield back. Thank you. The time has expired. Now recognize the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Moore. Ms. Moss, uh, thank you for being here today and, and sharing your family's personal story. Mr. Gobox, you, you said something a while ago that kind of, it kind of, you, when you said a lower bail percentage, you mentioned that in your testimony. 
Tell me, you know, I've heard of being soft on crime, but how is that impacting people getting back out and why lower bail percentage? If the bail bondsman is accepting a much smaller percentage, say 10% or 5% of the bail amount, and the bail amount itself is very small, then you may be, these boosters may be able to get out on bail for only $1,000 or even less. And so that results in, you know, them being detained for a very short period of time and that they can go right back to doing what they were doing. So in a situation like that, they would be back in a Lowe's or a Home Depot rather quickly once that decision is made to turn them back on the street. Right. Is that because they're soft on crime that the bail bondsman knows in fact that there's probably not gonna be a prosecution and they're not gonna jump? No, I, I think it's, uh, I would say that, you know, this is occurring in jurisdictions in, in my state that are certainly not soft on crime and the prosecutors are not soft on crime at all. It's just that uh, the judges, there's been a trend over the years in, in many states where there's no political dynamic going on, but the bonds are, be, the bail amounts are being set lower. And, uh, you know, I think that's something that legislative, we may, that legislatively, the legislators in Kansas may need to address. Um, but you, it's one of many factors that is causing a lack of prosecution or, in this case, a lack of detention. Gotcha. Um, how, how is your office working to toughen federal and state laws to stop these gangs from stealing in different jurisdictions and then stealing just enough to stow, stay below that felony threshold? What are you doing in that respect? Yeah, so they, they typically, in Kansas, the felony threshold's at 1,000, so you'll typically see them stealing 900 or so uh, in any given uh, criminal event. And the uh, prosecutors note this, and, it's, and as I said before, they've got a stack of cases, and if there's no person felony, it's only non-person felonies, they tend to fall to the bottom of the stack, and I'm not blaming local prosecutors. They have, there's a shortage of criminal, uh, criminal prosecuting attorneys across the country. In my office, at the state attorney general's office, we're having difficulty hiring to fill all the vacancies we have. But we do have capacity, and that's why in our state legislation that was recently adopted, um, we have primary prosecution authority if the case involves more than one county, which typically is, is, the, is the case in these organized retail crime networks. So we'll be bringing state resources to bear when that law takes effect on July 1st. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Mr. Milheiser, uh, what's happening in communities where the prosecutors fail to apply the laws? What, what are you seeing? You mentioned that in your testimony about you've got certain prosecutors that have just decided not to apply the law in the book, whether we change the law or not. If it's not applied, it's very, it's very ineffective for us to pass law after law, whether it be gun laws or drug laws or whatever the case, if in fact they're not prosecuted. What's going on in those communities, Mr. Milheiser? What we've seen, and it's pretty uniform around the country, in jurisdictions where a I call them so-called progressive prosecutors because prog a progressive prosecutor is not in and of itself a bad thing. You know, it could be a modern prosecutor that looks at diversion courts and specialty courts, all things I put in when I was the elected DA. Those are fine, but as prosecutors, when they come in with some other agenda, sort of these politically driven extremists that have done nothing but degrade the quality of the criminal justice system around the country in the communities that they serve. And I think what you see is crime goes up uh, businesses leave. We see what's happening in San Francisco. Now they recalled that DA last year. Uh, in St. Louis, that's another one with the circuit attorney, Kim Gardner, who recently a judge, before she resigned, a judge called her office a rudderless ship of chaos. Now I've run prosecutor's office. You don't want to have a judge call your office that. Um, but she not only had this political agenda, but she was inept and could not run an office. In Chicago, the same thing with Kim Fox, who is a, was a progressive prosecutor, so-called progressive, again, because they just decide, hey, I'm gonna raise the thresholds, I'm not gonna prosecute these cases. Um, and people come in, they don't file charges, they get right back out on the street. You know, I think the Chicago Police Department called it catch and release. But you see this in cities around the country when, when crimes are not prosecuted and there's no accountability, um, those criminals know it. Uh, and they're right back out to deadly consequences. Deadly consequences, and it's seen all around the country. And, and it get, the word gets around pretty quick, I understand, in communities where, where we're not prosecuting crimes, it, whether it's organized or just community, man, the word travels pretty quickly in those communities, and crime just kind of runs rampant. Is that what we're seeing? Very much so. So let, let's take uh, Illinois, for example. So you have Cook County, where you have Kim Fox, was the state's attorney, did a poor job of prosecuting cases. Will County, Jim Glasgow, Democrat, good prosecutor. DuPage County, Republican, Bob Berlin, good prosecutor. So those border Cook County. So those defendants know it. They know it. There was a carjacking last year. 
Thankfully, that car, carjacking person was arrested in Will County, where he was prosecuted and locked up. If that same case had happened in Cook County, the person would have been released the next day. So it's those jurisdictions that are thank incredibly you. dangerous. Thank you, Mr. Milhouse. I'm out of time. I'll, I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you. The chair recognizes the ranking member, the distinguished lady from Houston, Texas, Ms. Lee, Ms. Jackson Lee. Thank you for your courtesies, and let me thank uh, Congresswoman Dean for her questioning, and certainly to Congressman Swalwell uh, and to his constituent for his leadership, um, persistent leadership in assuring uh, justice for you. Uh, and I'm very appreciative of his presence here and as well his assistance um, in uh, kind of the ranking member capacity. So thank you so very much for your leadership on this issue. And I think we all want justice for uh, anyone that has been in the midst of a heinous crime um, that has uh, generated uh, in the loss of life. We want to come here today and, and fully appreciate what we're dealing with. Uh, so I want to thank the uh, gentleman from Arizona for yielding to me for my opening statement, which I will uh, try to, um, to summarize and come back again for questions. But uh, we're here today to uh, deal with the issue of retail crime. Recently, retailers and industry advocates have sounded the alarm, expressing concern that organized retail crime has become a significant threat to the retail industry. This criminal activity involves groups of individuals who operate in well-coordinated manner to steal goods or defraud retailers and resell stolen items for economic gain. Mr. Biggs, Congressman Biggs, just last week, I spoke to the mobile phone store owners. Uh, most of those stores are ground floor. All of them are ground floor. They're in shopping centers, strip centers, etc. And there's nothing like, uh, uh, I guess the terminology is uh, break the glass and grab. It's something else that smash and grab. Thank you so very much. Uh, and they were speaking of that, and I want to listen to them because that is heinous. It is an economic crime, but it's also violence uh, and um, uh, threatens the potential of people's lives. Smash and grab. We're not here to support that. It is a multi-billion dollar enterprise, and I want them to know that I'm listening uh, to those constituents in Houston who have businesses that are subject to that kind of crime. That evolves and adapts to the latest technological trends within the retail industry and among consumers and inevitably results in higher prices at the cash register. Social media and news reports are replete with videos of flash mobs rushing into stores and overwhelming and sometimes assaulting employees and leaving with bags and arm, armfuls of goods. Most of these retail items that from clothing to jewelry to phones, etc. While these anecdotal accounts are alarming, the federal role in deterring these crimes should be made clearer because it seems unclear. The federal government has been recognized, has re long recognized the problem and taken steps to combat organized retail crime and protect store employees, customers, and communities. Cooperation between retailers and federal and state law enforcement agencies through task forces and partnerships has been crucial in addressing these crimes and promoting public safety. For example, the FBI's Cleveland Field Office partnered with the Retail Industry Leaders Association and state and local law enforcement agencies to share expertise, intelligence, and resources to identify, investigate, and prosecute those who perpetrate these crimes. Over the past three years, Homeland Security investigation has tripled the number of cases it is investigating. Last year, HSI, Houston, and the Houston Police Department, who I applaud, uh, arrested eight people and seized nearly 2,000 stolen electronic devices, which is very likely the device of choice. Valued at approximately 1.8 million as part of a joint investigation uh, into a 65 million transnational organized retail crime operations suspected of smuggling stolen cell phones and other electronic overseas and laundering the proceeds. The FBI, the Secret Service, and Department of Homeland Security have all increased their efforts to investigate and prosecute retail crime because it's a domestic national security threat and it connects internationally. Even in spite of the efforts of law enforcement to address this activity, the issue of understanding the prevalence of organized retail crime persists largely due to a lack of consistent and comprehensive data. If I support legislation, that'd be one of the aspects of determining what is the level of this type of crime. Data gives us a pathway to solution. 
And while various retailers, retail organizations, law enforcement track retail theft, there is no uniform definition of organized retail crime or a standardized method for tracking such crimes, which makes it difficult to ascertain the full scope of the problem and formulate a targeted uh, response. Compound the inconsistency in data collection with retailers' reluctance to report the full extent of crimes committed in their stores, and lawmakers such as ourselves are left with little information that we can use to determine how Congress can help. If we can get sort of the relief from uh, insurance rates going up or uh, people not wanting to come to your store to these retailers so we can gather data, that might be a good step forward in getting the information we need. Moreover, the anonymous nature of the internet has made it easier for criminals to coordinate their activities and resell their ill-gotten merchandise. But monitoring online activity can be complicated. Not at all, not all transactions can be traced, making it even harder to understand the prevalence of organized retail crime as it occurs. Last Congress, we were able to pass the Inform Consumers Act, which takes effect this month. That's good news. That law will add more transparency to online transactions by requiring online marketplaces to collect, verify, and disclose certain information from high volume sellers and provides consumers with means to report suspicious activities. Despite there being no representative from the retailers present today, I hope our witnesses have been able to, because you've already been testifying, to help us determine whether there's more that the federal government can do to combat organized retail crime and certainly uh, to prevent the hardship of this mother. Uh, who has experienced a terrible crisis and devastating act in her life. Uh, I expect that they will be able to explain, or have been able to explain, uh, their vision for increased federal involvement, and I hope members have secured that information from them. While there are those who have advocated for federal organized crime statute, many in law enforcement argue that existing tools are sufficient. Uh, we will keep looking at this to combat these crimes. When considering the creation of new federal offenses, should be both thoughtful and careful, particularly if there are statutes already available to prosecute the conduct in question. Bearing that in mind, although federal law does not explicitly criminalize retail theft, the transportation of stolen goods across state lines, the sale or receipt of stolen goods, money laundering, conspiracy, all of which are components of organized retail crime and are all currently prohibited by federal law. Enforcement is certainly a key. Catching these bad guys and, and ladies is certainly important. Hopefully today's hearing has been able to determine and will continue to uh, what the impediments to investigating and prosecuting organized retail crime are due more to a lack of resources than a need for additional prosecutorial tools. And so I look forward to listening uh, to uh, the witnesses' answers so that we can be as effective as possible and yes, when it comes to the dastardly act of someone losing their life, that they'd never have that happen to a mother or family again. Uh, we know there is petty shoplifting, but we know that there is this thing called violent crime that hurts everyone. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, with that, Chair, recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Kiley. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for organizing uh, this hearing. Uh, we need to make crime illegal again. And uh, I'm uh, encouraged by the comments of the ranking member, which uh, made reference to these flash mobs and the smash and grabs, uh, which shows there's a bipartisan uh, interest in doing just that. I'm from California, uh, the state where this decriminalization agenda is perhaps in its most advanced stage. And to see uh, the perils of it, uh, you need look no further than what's going on in San Francisco as we speak. Uh, just yesterday, Mr. Chair, uh, Westfield Mall, the famous Westfield Mall in downtown San Francisco announced it's surrendering uh, the property to its lender, citing the difficult operating conditions downtown. Almost every day we're learning of new businesses that are closing uh, in San Francisco. In just the last few weeks, that includes T-Mobile, Old Navy, Nordstrom, Whole Foods, Anthropology. Uh, and many more. Um, it, the population is dramatically declining 
uh, in the city as well. In fact, it's declining faster than any major U.S. Uh, city in United States history, uh, faster even than Detroit when it went bankrupt. If you walk around uh, parts of uh, San Francisco, the conditions are truly horrifying. It's utter lawlessness. Uh, the subway system, um, public transportation is on the verge of collapse because of many reasons, one of which is people simply uh, don't feel safe riding. Uh, and indeed, the governor of California, Gavin Newsom, has even said he is sending the National Guard into San Francisco to restore order. Now, that seems to be a stunt because we haven't seen much action yet, but even he recognizes uh, the, uh, the situation and how dire it is. And CNN just did an hour-long special titled, What Happened to San Francisco? And so to answer that question, what happened, I think we can look uh, at a few things. Uh, number one is the laws that have been passed. Number two uh, is the approach to law enforcement. And number three uh, is the role of prosecutors. Uh, on the first count, when it comes uh, to the laws, uh, the chair mentioned Prop 40, 47, uh, which uh, is one of many uh, laws that have been passed in California that have in very uh, ill-calculated ways uh, lowered criminal penalties. This initiative passed uh, in 2014, and yes, it was approved by California voters, uh, but they were misled as to what they were voting for. This initiative was titled by its supporters the, quote, Safe Neighborhood and Schools Act. And it lowered the threshold uh, for a felony to below to over $950. Uh, and so you see uh, people who just uh, again and again and again go and steal below that threshold, and there's no consequence, and the retailers uh, don't even report uh, what's happening. And now, as the chair mentioned, there's even legislation to stop uh, you know, the stores from trying to stop this uh, from happening. And uh, to the point that one of the witnesses, uh, Mr. Uh, Milser, made, uh, which is that these policies are not truly progressive. Uh, in any meaningful sense of the word. One of the other things that Prop 47 did is that it took away penalties uh, for drug possession, which basically eviscerated the drug court system in California uh, because prosecutors no longer had leverage to encourage offenders to go into drug treatment. And so that's the prefer perverse irony, uh, is that laws like Prop 47 have both eroded public safety and compromised the capacity of our criminal justice system to rehabilitate offenders. Uh, there have been many other laws along these lines. Prop 57 passed. That used another trick, which is to classify uh, offenses as nonviolent, even though they're often quite violent, uh, and then they tell that people that's what they're voting for when uh, obviously it's something much different. You've had this governor and his predecessor have released tens of thousands uh, of people early uh, under the banner of executive authority. You had what was known as realignment, where prison populations were shifted into county jails, which aren't built uh, to deal with those sorts of offenders, uh, and uh, the list goes on and on and on, and then at the same time, Time, you had jurisdictions like San Francisco uh, that chose to defund police departments. Now, a lot of that has been reversed now because they realize what a disaster it was, but the damage has been done in a lot of ways, and you still have uh, police departments throughout California that are having a very, very difficult time with recruitment uh, and continue to be understaffed because of this anti-law enforcement message that came from some of our state's leading pro uh, politicians. And then finally, you had in places like San Francisco and Los Angeles, these so-called, I'll adopt that term terminology, progressive prosecutors, the really political prosecutors who came in with an agenda and refused to even enforce the laws that were there. But here's the big takeaway uh, from all of this, which is that this, uh, you know, uh, decriminalization agenda is massively unpopular in California. Uh, the district attorney of San Francisco was overwhelmingly recalled from office. By the way, the Trump-Pence ticket got 12% in San Francisco. This isn't some uh, conservative bastion. You've had dozens of city councils have issued uh, votes of no confidence against George Gascon in Los Angeles. And California voters overwhelmingly say crime is a major problem, and at this point they favor repealing Prop 47 by two to one. So I thank the chair for this uh, opportunity uh, to issue this warning to other jurisdictions not to follow the California example and to marshal whatever federal support we can to make up for the reckless policies of our state's politicians. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentleman yields. Uh, the chair recognizes the, again the ranking member from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee, for her five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Um, and thank the gentleman from California for um, giving us an overview. Um, I, I think my statement was very clear. Uh, we've got to find a way to pinpoint uh, just what uh, 
the uh, extent, damage, um, violence of retail crime, organized crime. And I think it's uh, very important um, that um, we give um, local police the authority and we give them the ability to uh, distinguish against uh, a homeless person, teenager, somebody who's uh, come into um, uh, a retail place for one item or, or teenagers so that we can focus our resources on um, keying in uh, to saving lives when violent acts generate and also to really quash this kind of retail crime. We've got to get our hands around it. Uh, so Mr. Flynn, uh, if you would help me out. Um, there's a study conducted by the National Retail Federation um, that found that boosters use money earned from retail theft to meet their basic needs or to support a drug habit. Please tell us more about the Vibrant Communities Initiative and then how will this program prevent vulnerable people from falling prey to organized retail crime recruiters, almost like human trafficking where uh, the folk are not prostitutes but they fall victim to being recruited by human traffickers to be prostitutes, uh, even just recently in my community uh, at a high school. So would you help us with that, please? Yes, ma'am. So what, what you see a lot of times that you alluded to are, uh, are individuals who get caught up uh, in, as I characterized before, some of these loosely affiliated groups. Uh, so you, you may have a, uh, a, a drug dealer or an individual who is involved in human trafficking, um, and then that, that individual may have you know, a stable of four or five people who are indeed drug addicts um, or um, you know, uh, uh, women who are caught up in, the, in, in sex trafficking who they use as boosters uh, to go out and, and, and steal uh, in stores. And so you know, the, the individuals who are the perpetrators of the crime, who are actually in the stores, are, are in fact individuals who need help. They have a drug problem, they have a substance abuse problem, they have an alcohol problem, even sometimes a mental illness. And so, you know, we obviously want to help them out, but at the same time, if there is an individual who is uh, using them to go out in the stores, um, that person needs to be held accountable, uh, obviously, and, and, and looked at in a different manner. So, so the initiative is, is holistic in the sense that we're trying to identify who the players are, what their roles are in the crime, and give services, and as Mr. Milheiser mentioned, diversion programs to those who need it, but at the same time, help hold people accountable who need to be held accountable. Very quickly, my time is, uh, I should, probably shouldn't acknowledge that to the chairman, but let me quickly, um, <laughs> let, me, let me quickly go to um, understanding how we uh, distinguish the shoplifting persons, not, not indicating that that is not bad from organized crime, that number one, and is there a way that local law enforcement and the state can collaborate with federal law enforcement on these big organized circumstances? So start first with the shoplifting and organized retail crime, both bad, but you know that's getting a loaf of bread in the old days and something else. Um, uh, it's certainly not coming in with a gun and killing an innocent person, such as Ms. Uh, Mose. Is that pronounced? Ms. Mose has experienced, which is dastardly and, and horrific. So the the only way that we can ascertain whether or not there is a higher up. Let's use that phrase there for as, you know as an example. Uh, is if one of the perpetrators talks, um, you know, if a defense lawyer comes to me and says, "Hey, you know, my client got picked up for you know stealing a hundred bucks worth of stuff," and you know they, they want to cooperate now and and talk and talk about who the higher ups are, uh, then we find out, uh, and and then we can also find out through other investigative tools, but. Uh, unless we get some type of intelligence or cooperation from, you know, the the, the boosters, um, it's difficult to uh, to work our way up the food chain. 
But are you able to tell between shoplifting and organizing? Somebody's time's expired. Uh, mm. yeah, yes, um, we, we, we are able to tell, um, you know, from a, uh, an individual who's just using it for their own personal needs, uh, or if they are taking the merchandise and then giving it to someone or, or themselves sometimes putting it online for resale, um, we, we can tell a lot of times. All right, Mr. Chairman, I, I do yield, but I will have some articles to submit and maybe one more question. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Fry from South Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for having this hearing today to our witnesses. Thank you, Ms. Mose. I, I'm always struck when we have people who are victims in crime, just in general, who, who come to this committee, uh, who testify. It's incredibly brave of you to be here. We appreciate it. Uh, and thank you for sharing your son's story with us. You know, we find ourselves in this perplexing situation since, we've, since I've been here in six months that we are constantly looking at, whether it's New York, whether it's Washington, D.C. and the Oversight Committee, we are talking about, and the attorneys on the panel talked about this pretty, pretty easily, the inability of district attorneys to prosecute crimes and enforce the laws that are on the books. Uh, we even had, in, in the case of New York, we even had Democrat city councilmen saying that they weren't, that the, the district attorney was refusing to do his job and it has increased crime on the streets. And of course, we talk about, in this case, organized retail crime and the criminals are winning in our, in our society right now. They really are. There's this, this, this wide gulf uh, that exists that we want to play footsie and we want to play cute with law enforcement, but people are suffering, businesses are suffering, families are suffering. Um, just in the district that I represent, the Myrtle Beach Police Department, just a few years ago, uh, along with federal agents, had a task force that opened an investigation into organized retail crime um, an estimated $24,000 worth of new in-the-box merchandise, headphones, Roombas, power tools, nine rifles, sh seven shotguns, uh, an ATV, another ATV, a John Deere, a lawnmower, easy golf cart, or, or excuse me, easy go golf cart, seven trailers. This is just a drop in the bucket, and this is just in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. We see this time and time again, uh, and that's the problem, is that, that I think you guys hit on it very easily, which is these things happen, and criminals think that they have a carte blanche invitation to continue doing these things because there are no repercussions for the actions uh, that they do. Attorney General, I want to turn to you real quick. Last year, Congress passed the Informed Consumers Act requiring online marketers to verify the identities uh, of the majority of their sellers. We know that stolen goods appear in these marketplaces in large quantity. We hear from retailers constantly. Um, the Inform Act goes into effect at the end of this month. How would this law help your office be more effective in prosecuting ORC cases? I think the act will help. Um, the majority of goods are st are these days are being fenced, being stolen, sorry, being sold by the fences online on these uh, various marketplaces online. So uh, requiring a higher level of certainty and knowing your supplier, I guess, would be the right way to put it, is, uh, is certainly going to help. And indeed, most of the criminal lead, well, I won't say most, many of the criminal leads that prosecutors do get are in the actual se selling of the good uh, on, online and using a number of methods to determine that this is likely the same good that was stolen from a Home Depot a month before or whatever. So uh, the more we can learn about the transactions and those who are selling the goods online, the more uh, tools we will have in the toolbox to, uh, to bring these prosecutions, uh, which need to be brought. If we, if we prosecute more cases, the, the, it's not rocket science. The problem will diminish if we increase the amount of prosecution. And in, in your office, do, all, do you coordinate right now with retailers on implementation of this to better understand how uh, this new tool will build uh, opportunities to prosecute these cases? We coordinate with retailers a great deal already, and we have not discussed this new tool yet, but I'm sure that we will be. The retailers are actually a, a very good source of information, and uh, like Mrs. Moe's son, uh, many of them have individuals whose, whose sole job is to keep track of and try to deter and diminish the in-store theft. So the retail, retailers are an invaluable source in prosecuting. Thank you, and, and just just briefly, part you know, part of this, I look at this this issue. Part of this is maybe the like Lululemon fired their employees for going after somebody who was stealing, right? So there's some some corporate issues that are related to this. Uh, part of this is it, the inability of district attorneys to do their job, quite frankly, and prosecute cases. Um, but the task that we have, at least in in Congress, is 
Is, is there, uh, would it be helpful to have a federal partner uh, prosecute these cases across interstate lines? And I'll, I'll leave that, Attorney General, or to the other lawyers on the, on the panel. Yeah, I mentioned something uh, about that point. I think we have to bring the, the maximum number of prosecutors to bear, period. And that means uh, reducing the threshold. Right now, there seems to be, in, at least in the middle, middle part of the country, a $250,000 threshold before the feds, the prosecutors will be in the U.S. Attorney's offices will be interested. Uh, it would be better if they would be interested in, in interstate cases at a lower level. Uh, in my state, we're bringing state prosecutors to bear, so the burden doesn't just fall on county attorneys and district attorneys. And I think, you know, resources to hire attorneys at all levels are, are important. We, we need more prosecution to occur. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm out of time. I yield back. Thank you. Um, uh, the ranking member has some documents she wants to admit to the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I ask unanimous consent to submit into the record, number one, a statement from Trevor Wagner, Chief Economist and Director of Research for the Computer and Communications Industry. I ask unanimous consent. Without objection. And number two, a September 23, 2021 article from The Atlantic entitled, The Great Shop Lifting Freak Out. Why is it so hard to figure out if America's enormous surge in theft uh, is real? That's unanimous consent. Without objection, and now I recognize the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Florida is one of nearly three dozen states that have passed uh, organized retail crime statutes. And we've actually gone one step further by launching something called FORCE, which is the Florida Organized Retail Crime Exchange, a task force and database for police, prosecutors, and retailers to work together to organize, uh, to identify organized retail theft rings. Uh, and it's been our experience that communication among stakeholders, the private sector, law enforcement, uh, both public and private, is really a key part of identifying and combating uh, these violent and costly crimes. Um, and I would like to start with you, uh, Mr. Is it, I want to get it right, is it Milheiser? All right. Mr. Milheiser, I know you too have a significant background as a uh, former federal prosecutor, and I, I, you had mentioned this in your testimony, the same concept. Would you please elaborate on your experience and your observation on how those private partner uh, collaborations with federal law enforcement agencies can be really, an important part of really combating this problem? Right. Well, there are examples that have been successful. If you look at human trafficking, uh, drugs, OSADEF, when we attack kind of the gang problem and the cartels coming in from Mexico. So the best way to attack it is to have as many people at the table uh, all kind of pulling their weight and doing their job. So we need the local prosecutors there to prosecute, oftentimes the bulk of the cases, but then also the federal prosecutors there to get involved too. Um, federal law enforcement oftentimes can help with um, the kind of technical aspects of these cases, you know, if they're crossing state lines, using computers, oftentimes out of the country, you know, these are international operations. So you have the Secret Service and the FBI and you have these other federal law enforcement agencies that can use their expertise and everyone working together collaboratively is the best way to attack the problem. But the only way it works is if everyone does their job and every part of the person there. You know, the, the feds have to say, yeah, we'll sit at the table and we'll actually file charges. You know, I spent a long time and I would guess Mr. Flynn has this problem sometimes too. So working with the feds on cases, you know, sometimes they're like, hey, we're too busy. We don't want to file that. No, no, you're going to file that because it's going to help and it, what is best for the community. So everyone has to get together and sit down and how can we best attack the problem? Everybody has to carry their weight and do their job. And now you just touched on something that's very important there, the collaboration between those federal law enforcement resources, uh, but also local and the, and the important role of working together. Would you describe for us the role of local law enforcement in that process? We've got the feds at the table. They're providing expertise and resources. Uh, describe for us the role, though, of the local on the ground law enforcement as well. 100%. They are a, a big part of the equation. You know, when you look at law enforcement around the country, 85% of it is state and local and tribal. So the federal law enforcement is a small part of law enforcement in general in, in this country. So those local individuals have to be used. I mean, for a long time, I was a state court prosecutor and worked with those local sheriffs, worked with the local police um, to help identify uh, those criminals, help bring them to justice, help prosecute cases. Uh, so they play an integral part and it cannot be uh, 
you know, law enforcement in their silos, silos, whether it be FBI or DEA in their silo, sheriffs, police in their silo, they have to be talking, they have to be coordinating uh, to best attack the problem. And so on that subject, in the event that local law enforcement, whether it is a local district attorney, a local police chief, in the event that one of the individuals who should be at that table and part of that collaboration decides not to do their job, whether it is one of these soft on crime policies, a decision not to prosecute certain offenses, how does that affect the overall effectiveness of combating criminal activity in our communities? Well, it, it has a negative effect. I mean, when you don't have everybody pulling their weight and doing their job, especially the local uh, prosecutor. So if the lo local prosecutor is not willing to prosecute these cases, uh, not willing to do their part, it has a negative effect. Um, and I guess then the next question is, what do we do about that? Um, I think one thing we do is call those prosecutors out. Now it's difficult, obviously, uh, in this forum, but it's for the community to become aware of it. You know, I, I mentioned during my testimony, uh, an organization I started, the American Center for Law and Public Safety, with U.S. attorneys from around the country. We have law enforcement, local prosecutors to do this very thing, to educate the public on what is a good prosecutor, what is needed, how can we have safe communities, and to call out those bad prosecutors. Because I, I think people for years took for granted that their local prosecutor was going to do their job and prosecute cases, and all of a sudden they didn't. Crime increased. And they're like, oh my gosh, what happened? So we need to educate the public on what is a good prosecutor and assist those with resources. That's where the federal government can come into play. You know, there's often scarce resources for local prosecutors. They can assist in that way. All right. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. And I'm going to allow the ranking member to recognize her for one question. But I know her, and she <laughs> could, she's capable of asking what we call in, in the trade a compound question. <laughs> Or a running, a running. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm trusting her that it's just one question. It is. <laughs> right, it thank is. you, Madam. We thank you uh, to the chairman for your kindness. Uh, Attorney General Kobach, am I getting that close to uh, pronunciation, sir? Kobach, yeah. Thank you so very much. Um, I've studied uh, this issue because the chairman was kind enough to bring it to our attention. So we found a recent workshop on crime trends in Kansas, Wichita with uh, your police chief, Joe Sullivan, that said that among larger national chains, Wichita ranks among the worst for retail theft. He went on to say that getting these people into treatment would have an unbelievable impact on organized retail theft, because I think it ties into what Mr. Flynn has said, because the vast majority of the thieves, they're like you know, agents, workers, um, commit these crimes to sell the stolen items and buy drugs or get them to their handler. So do you agree with Chief Sullivan's assessment? While this is not the only answer, could we not reduce the prevalence of these crimes by addressing as a component uh, the current public health crisis of drug addiction? So these people are used, I say mules. I mean, there's a lot of terminology uh, to utilize um, in this instance. Mr. General? Yeah, I, do, I do agree with what uh, the Wichita police chief said. Uh, there, the Boosters who are drug addicted are recruited so they can support their habits. They're recruited by the fences, at least in Kansas, who tend to be the ones who are organizing the or or these retail crime networks. They're given assignments by the fence, what to go steal next, where to steal it. And they are, they are used as mules, as mm -hmm. you can also use that analogy, uh, in these networks. So certainly, the, if there are fewer drug addicted people recruitable, uh, then that would reduce the total pool of, of recruits to be boosters. Although I don't think that alone would solve the problem, but it certainly would be a component of the problem. Well, we uh, certainly want to get rid of the fences for sure. Yep. You know, thank you so very much. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, uh, Ms. Jackson Lee. Uh, I recognize myself for five minutes of questioning. Uh, Ms. Mose, again, thank you for coming in and sharing your, your son's uh, story and his life with us and, and bringing your father with, with you as well. I just want to make sure that every, everyone knows, like I want to make clear, clear the um, individual who murdered your son uh, was, on, if I understood you right, was on probation and had been on probation for more than 10 years. Is that fair to say? My understanding was that her probation had been revoked and she was in violation as of 2012. I'm sorry, not revoked, but in violation of, and she was out on the street. I see. And um, 
And a similar situation with the getaway driver. The getaway driver um, had been incarcerated for a home invasion robbery and was released during COVID in the California's attempt to reduce um, inmates. All right. Well, thank you. And I, you know, it is, it was, you had described it correctly. It was a system failure. There was a law on the books. She was not to be a possessor. Somehow she uh, uh, had a gun and she used it violently. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's a system failure in my opinion. And then, and we, we uh, hope that we can learn and, and go forward and, and change the system where we need to make changes. Thank you for sharing that. I wanna to get to something that you, you testified to, uh, Attorney General Kobach, and it's, and it's right on my experience with other things, and that is you talked about the threshold. Um, for instance, the U.S. Attorney saying, if it's an interstate uh, transport of thefts, uh, stolen goods, it's 250,000 um, bucks. In Arizona, uh, the U.S. Attorney has basically said they're not going to carry, they're not going to charge, for instance, mules carrying pot unless they're carrying several hundred pounds in the desert and they actually still have it on their person uh, when they're apprehended. Uh, how does the raising of those thresholds impede the actual enforcement of our law? It, it, it certainly does and it, uh, it's amazing. I think one of the things that uh, has surprised me about all this is how savvy and how quickly informed the organized retail crime networks are. They learn very quickly where the thresholds are. Now, some of them are statutory thresholds as to where the felony level is, but they will learn what they can get away with. And it, in, in, an, in an interstate case, that, that's where the feds could come in and help. There's, as I mentioned, there's a, a, a lack of prosecutorial resources generally, and if we can get the feds involved in a lower level, that would greatly increase our resources. And even looking within the state, like in, in Kansas, where we're looking where we can help, um, the the local prosecutors they have a lack they have a huge pile of cases and a lack of resources to address those cases and and they may not recognize and this uh, this is where Ms. Lee's question is is particularly important they may not have enough information to recognize that the two thefts at this Home Depot were committed by the same network that in the neighboring county did five thefts at a Lowe's and a, and a Walmart etc. And so by having this information sharing, which we're doing in Kansas through the Kansas Bureau of Investigation, we can put two and two together, connect the dots, and realize that this isn't just a theft of $900 at one store. It's part of a much larger network that's stolen $200,000. And that gets the, atten the attention not only of local uh, attorney, prosecuting attorneys, but certainly that's where the, our state resources come into play as well. So uh, I am intrigued by the notion um that there's, there are different levels. I agree with that. Having been in, in uh, the judicial brand, actually prosecuting, I prosecuted some shoplift cases. They were never, we rarely saw an organization, uh, uh, you know, we saw a small single one-offs. But now we see these organizations. I would venture to say that not every booster is actually necessarily a drug addict. They're, they're engaged, some of them are engaged in criminal conduct. I wanted your opinion on that, Mr. Milheiser. Well, I mean, I guess to, to follow what Ms. Jackson Lee said, when we talk about whether it's somebody that's homeless, there's all kinds of issues that these individuals that are arrested have. Homeless, substance abuse. Um, when we let them out of jail or prison, we need to, as a society, and as a good, and a good prosecutor does, put them in the best position not to reoffend. Right? We want to reduce recidivism. And, so and what, yet what is a recidivism rate? Right? Oh, it's incredibly high. I mean, I, I think we would all say that it's more than half. They get out, they reoffend, especially if they go back to that same environment they were in. I mean, they're going to reoffend. So what do we have to do? We have to look and say employment, housing, substance abuse, mental health treatment. Those four things. Look at that and what can we do? And that's where we talk about collaboration. It's not just law enforcement. It is other government services, it's not for profits, it's all those individuals in a community that can help when these individuals get, get out to keep them crime free. Well, thank you, I, I again thank the witnesses. My time has expired. Um, I appreciate every member of the committee being here and participating and again, um, this is a real serious, serious issue that 
um, needs, in my opinion, a el continued elevation of, of notoriety so people will respond, particularly at the state and local levels. And the, and the federal level, have, we, have our, we have the things we should be doing, but we certainly want to encourage our state and local levels whose resources are stretched thin to actually enforce the law and, and, and really help out here. But thanks again for being here. With that, we are adjourned.